name is Leslie Berger. I'm the library director, and I'd like to welcome you all here this evening for what we think is a very important program on a topic that is of great importance to our community. Um, this program is just one of many programs that we like to put together at the library to address issues that are um, of concern to our community and to do it quickly, not after the fact as a, as a look back, but really during the time that these issues are under discussion in the news and um, and really affect the people who live and work in Princeton. So I would like to thank Maria. Maria Vega, who is the chair of the Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund, for really doing all the work to put this program together so quickly um, in response to what was happening um, in Princeton late last year in terms of the immigration rates. And, and Maria will, will introduce our speakers in just a few moments. I would also like to announce another initiative that the library is about to undertake. And that is with, in conjunction with the Latin American Task Force, we are going to be hosting their Ask a Lawyer program here beginning in April, April 4th, which is a Monday evening in this room. It will be offered from 7 to 9 p.m. And that is basically a drop-in meeting where people can just come in and ask a lawyer um, for legal cons consultations on issues related to immigration and general law. So we are pleased to be the host for that program and feel it's very much a part of what we do here at the library, which is to expose people to information in a variety of formats, not just what's contained in books or what they can find on a computer, but what they can learn from people and what we can learn from each other. So we're happy to be the host for that program. And without taking up any more time, I will turn this over to Maria to introduce our panelists this evening. Thank you uh, very much, Leslie. Um, we're very grateful to uh, Leslie Berger and to Susan Roth for opening their minds to uh, holding this forum and opening the doors of the library. Um, and also for Tim Quinn, who designed the wonderful flyer and uh, did a great job publicizing uh, this event. Um, we also want to thank the staff of TB30 for being here tonight on very short notice. We appreciate it, and uh, it will give the opportunity of those who couldn't make it here to watch it on TB30 on our public access uh, TV channel. So pass the word. Um, and of course, we're very grateful to our panelists for uh, making the time to be here tonight and uh, enlightening us, um, as I'm sure they will. Uh, and we're also very honored to uh, have the presence of a uh, representative uh, from the Guatemalan Consulate, uh, Maria, Lu Lu Ma Maria Luz Zayrek, uh, right here, and she'll be available to answer questions later during the Q&A. Um, illegal immigration <coughs> is a topic that has been appearing with increasing frequency in the local headlines. Uh, I'm often asked whether it is because of the level of enforcement in and around Mercer County uh, has increased or whether um, we have become more conscious of it. Based on first-hand reports from immigration attorneys and the staff of the Guatemalan Consulate in New York, we believe that we are in fact witnessing a definite pickup in enforcement. However, it's also true that the level of consciousness about the lives and the roles of the immigrants in our community has indeed be been raised by recent events. When choosing the title of this forum, we hesitated whether to use the term illegal immigration because of the uh, negative connotations it brings to the surface. But we decided not to mince words in identifying what we were here to talk about. It's not clear why Mercer County has become a target for enforcement. The official 2000 census uh, count of the Latino population is 34,000, or 10% of the population of the county, of which 40% are Puerto Ricans who are citizens. So relatively speaking, the Latino immigrant population here is very small compared to other counties, even if we use the estimates of a recent report by the United Way of Mercer County, which speculates that adding un uncounted, undocumented immigrants uh, may bring the total Latino population up to 50,000. So even though Mercer County may be home to, let's say, 15 to 20,000 undocumented Latino immigrants, this is probably no more than 5% of the total undocumented immigrant population of the state, which has been variously estimated to be between 250,000 and 500,000. Over the weekend, I was fortunate 
uh, to sneak into a conference in Princeton University with some of the top political scientists on the subject of immigration, which included Professor Bosniak. Although it should come as no surprise to anyone that public perception of illegal immigrants is very negative, I did not know to what extent that is. Apparently, they, the illegal immigrants, together with gay and lesbians, are among the most disliked groups in America today, according to public opinion polls. Um, do illegal immigrants deserve this rap? Are they to blame for the evils of illegal immigration? Are they here to take away the jobs of the poorest, less, less educated American citizens, thus helping to keep wages down for everyone and increasing inequality? Are they taking advantage of our social services, fueling an underground economy, uh, and not paying their fair share? Or are they the pawns of bad public policies that ignore economic imperatives and political realities, the easy targets of political expediency looking to demonize immigrants um, rather than deal with the root causes of a very complex problem? And how do we solve the problems of illegal immigration, which has ballooned into an estimated population of some 10 million uh, and growing apparently by over half a million each year? New Jersey is one of the top destinations for this flow, the fifth state in terms of size of immigrant population, over one and a half million, uh, or 18 percent of the total population. How do state and local governments deal with this growing population that in many respects is an integral part of our communal fabric, but is barred from access to basic citizenship rights or benefits, for example, a driver's license, the protection of some labor laws, or secondary education? And how do we, as moral human beings, reconcile the abstraction of condemning illegal immigration as a social evil, but with the, uh, with the concrete reality of seeing people we have employed as our housekeepers, our gardeners, the same people who prepare our lunch at the local eatery every day, or clean our office every night, taken away in handcuffs as criminals, jailed and deported, while their families remain behind emotionally and economically devastated. It takes two to tango. The illegal immigration does not occur without pull factors. As direct or indirect beneficiaries of illegal immigration, what is our responsibility as citizens for maintaining these schizophrenic conditions? We hope that this will be the first of a series of forums which we will explore, uh, in which we will explore <coughs> other perspectives, like the economic and the political. But tonight, we would like to start exploring these questions from two perspectives, the sociological and the legal. We're very fortunate to have two internationally recognized experts in their respective disciplines in our panel. Douglas Massey is professor of sociology at Princeton and has done extensive research on international migration, focusing on Mexico. As a matter of fact, he just came from Mexico from attending a conference there. Um, and is the author of several books on the subject. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the past president of the American Sociological Association. Linda Bosniak is professor of law at Rutgers, Candom, where she teaches immigration, constitutional, and employment discrimination uh, law. Previously, she practiced civil rights and labor law in New York City. She has written extensively on immigration and citizenship and is currently working on a book from Princeton University Press, The Citizen and the Alien, Dilemmas of Contemporary Membership, which is exactly the topic of our discussion tonight. Also with us tonight is uh, Ryan Lilienthal, an immigration attorney in private practice here in Princeton. Uh, Ryan is a graduate of the Brooklyn School of Law and a former Princeton Borough Councilman. Ryan was the brain and the force behind the pro-immigrant resolution uh, presented and adopted by the Princeton Borough last November, uh, weeks after the immigration raid uh, on Witherspoon Street. He's a very active member in the Princeton community, well known, and sits on the board of this library as well as the Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund, among other organizations. Um, each panelist will have 15 minutes to uh, do a presentation and uh, we'll follow with a Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd say it's a pleasure to be here, but there's a foot of snow outside, and I left Mexico yesterday, and it was 75 degrees and sunny. But it's a pleasure to be here tonight, because I, <clears throat> I work in many areas of public policy research, and the area of immigration is the one with the largest gap 
between what scholars actually know about immigration and what public, the public and policymakers think they know about immigration. <clears throat> the roots of the current problem go back to 1986. In 1986, the U.S. Congress passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act that was supposed to solve the problem of illegal migration, focused particularly on Mexico. It authorized two separate legalization programs and over the next couple of years legalized 3.1 million people from undocumented to documented status, including 2.3 million Mexicans. After the end of the legalization program around 1990, the undocumented population in the United States was less than 2 million people, according to the best estimates. That was the lowest point in more than a decade. However, as you heard earlier, the undocumented population now stands at approximately 10 million. This is an unfolding humanitarian tragedy and a social and economic disaster, not only for the migrants themselves, but for American society and for our closest neighbor and friend in the hemisphere, Mexico. And it's largely a tragedy of our own making. For 1986, we struck out boldly in two opposing directions. <clears throat> two opposing directions that were guaranteed to produce the results we now observe. <clears throat> On the one hand, in 1986, under U.S. pressure, Mexico dramatically rescaled its economy and joined the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, opening its economy to international investment, international forces, and seeking to participate in global markets. Emblematic of this transformation was the fact that two years later, the President of Mexico extended a hand outward to the United States, seeking to institutionalize those free market reforms and make them permanent through the North American Free Trade Agreement. The North American Free Trade Agreement was negotiated and ratified by Congress under President Clinton, negotiated under the first George Bush, ratified by Clinton, and took effect on January 1st, 1994. Since that date, the United States is committed by treaty to integrating the North American economy to promote more rapid and freer movements of all kinds of things across the border between Mexico and the United States as well as between Canada and the United States. <laughs> By treaty, we are committed to increasing the flows of goods, of capital, of information, of consumables, of raw materials, of business employees, of exchange scholars, of company transferees, of investors, but magically, within this integrated North American economy, we don't want any labor moving. We seek to create an integrated North American economy that links together all markets except one. This is a fundamental contradiction because everything that happens in the course of market integration promotes interchange and movement of people. To maintain the fiction that somehow we will be able to integrate the North American market while somehow keeping labor south of the Rio Grande, we have embarked on a massive program of enforcement and repression. The 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act was the first salvo in a series of assaults aimed at the Mexico-US border. 
the Immigration Reform and Control Act, for the first time in American history, outlawed the hiring of unauthorized workers and penalized employers who did so in an effort to dry up jobs in the United States. At the same time, it began a massive escalation of border enforcement, which accelerated dramatically with the launching of Operation Blockade in 1993 in El Paso, followed by Operation Gatekeeper in Tijuana in 1994. Between 1986 and the present, the number of Border Patrol officers has gone from under 2,000 to more than 12,000. The enforcement budget of the Border Patrol has gone from under $200 million to currently $1.4 billion. This is a militarization of a border with a country with whom we are at peace, of a country that is in fact our largest trading partner. At any point in time, there are probably close, anywhere between 500,000 and a million Americans in Mexico. And there are currently 8 million people, or 10 million people of Mexican birth living in the United States. This fundamental contradiction has produced the tragedy we see unfolding today. Many people believe that Mexico is this poor country from which people flee because they have no other option. Mexico is, in fact, a wealthy country. Its per capita income is about $10,000, just slightly lower than Puerto Rico. It has a $1 trillion economy, 105 million people, it's our closest trading partner, and yet our immigration laws give it the same annual quota for legal immigrants as Nepal or Botswana, 20,000 people. Two countries that are at peace, increasingly integrated economically, engaging in a rapid acceleration of flows of all sorts for that situation to be to have put up 20,000 is an invitation for undocumented migration. The sad the fact about our strategy of border enforcement is that it has not produced significant declines in the number of people entering the United States. The paradoxical fact, the paradoxical effect of border enforcement like that is that it doesn't deter people from entering, it deters them from going home once they're here. If you look at the data, there have been ebbs and flows in the probability of migrating without documents to the United States, largely fluctuating with economic conditions on both sides of the world. No massive increase, fairly steady flow. What has changed dramatically with our rise in border enforcement has been the outflow. The probability of return migration has fallen dramatically. Whereby, in 1986, the probability the migrant would return home after a year was on the order of 50 or 60 percent. It's now down to 10 to 20 percent. If you militarize the border within a country, with a country with which you are at peace and integrating economically, you deter people from going home, you don't affect the inflow, you dramatically lower the outflow, and we have unintentionally, or perhaps intentionally, if you're a cynic, accelerated the rate of undocumented population growth in the United States. It has, our policies have increased the rate of undocumented population growth. They have transformed the undocumented population from a regional phenomenon affecting a small number of states to a national phenomenon affecting all 50 states. They have transformed what was a circular movement of workers into a settled population of families, increasing the social costs to the United States. The United States finds itself at an important crossroads. and is facing a grave humanitarian situation. As the population 
of Mexico, of undocumented migrants in the United States has grown and shifted from workers to dependents. The number of children who came here as minors and grew up in this country, attending our schools, speaking our language, learning our culture, has skyrocketed. And there are somewhere now around 3 million minors, or people who entered as minors, in undocumented status. Now, whatever you may want to debate about the culpability of their parents for coming here, these minors are surely blameless. Their only sin, their only crime, is obeying their parents and following their parents. Yet, in the United States, they have a permanent barrier to their mobility. They can be deported at any time at the whim of the government. They cannot go to college. They cannot advance in our society. They cannot be employed in any, in any but the most menial jobs. No matter what their skills, no matter what their ambitions, no matter what their educational background, through high school. And this problem is day by day getting worse and worse. The 1986 Immigration Reform Act, Control and Reform Act, also had another negative effect. As I said, it outlawed the hiring of undocumented workers. In a naive attempt, to close off the demand for such workers. In fact, the only thing that it did was push the flows further other underground and push down the wages and undermine the working conditions, not of immigrants, but of citizens and legal resident aliens. Because the demand for undocumented workers was structurally built into the American economy, employers rather than uh, uh, giving up workers and suffering economic losses, simply shifted their hiring strategies. Rather than hiring immigrants directly, they began to use subcontractors. Before 1986, an immigrant would show up at a farm or a factory and say, give me a job, por favor. And the employer would say, well, you look good to me, you're hired. And if the immigration authorities came to that fact and found undocumented workers, they could be deported. But the employer was not culpable under the law. That changed in 1986. Because the workers were still necessary, the employers started working through subcontractors, signing contracts with citizens or resident aliens who agreed to provide so many workers for, under such terms uh, for such payment per hour. Of course, the labor contractors took a chunk of what used to go to workers as wages. And the tragedy is that it doesn't matter what your citizenship status is. In industries that have strong input of immigrant workers, everyone has to work through a labor subcontractor because that is now how it's done. So it undermined the wages and working conditions, not of immigrants who never had it that great, but of American citizens who worked in the same markets. So the time has come, I believe, to rethink our whole approach to immigration. Rather than considering it as a pathological, pathological condition to be stamped out through ever more repressive measures, we need to think about immigration as the logical consequence of broader processes of social and economic integration and like the movement of goods and capital, attempt to regulate in the interests of both parties. Simply put, we need to increase the quota for legal immigrants, for Mexico in particular, and the Western Hemisphere more generally. We need to declare an amnesty to get ourselves out of the humanitarian tragedy that we now find ourselves in. We need to establish a humane guest worker program that allows workers into the United States and gives them working rights in labor markets and does not frustrate their desire to actually return home, thereby minimizing the social costs to our own country. And in setting up these legal programs, we charge them a fee and we collect taxes and we use that money to offset the very real costs of immigration. 
And in the end, we would have smaller immigrant population in the United States living under better conditions with less downward pressure on American working conditions and wages and uh, smaller net growth through immigration to the United States. That's the direction we should be moving. Unfortunately, I don't see our policy makers currently taking note. <coughs> My hope is by educating the public, people like you, we can create the political will to create a new immigrant policy that is not only more rational and more humane, but very much more in our own self-interest. tonight is to provide a really quick overview of the legal status of people that we call undocumented immigrants um, in the United States in order to provide a context for our policy discussions uh, about where we should be going. Um, and there are both national and local dimensions to this policy conversation, and my remarks uh, will be relevant to both. And I want to start with definitions and terminology. Um, when we talk about undocumented immigrants or illegal immigrants, who are we talking about? Um, undocumented immigrants are foreign nationals present in the United States who, uh, mean who, who are present in unauthorized or irregular uh, immigration status. About half of the undocumented immigrants have entered without authorization, entered surreptitiously, often across the southern border. The other half, though, oh, sure. Uh, can you hear me? The other half uh, uh, are people who entered with authorization, with uh, visas, temporary visas, who overstayed or in other ways uh, violated the terms of their visas. So they entered as, as tourists and they, they didn't return home uh, when they were supposed to, or they entered as students and began to work. And it's important, first of all, to just understand that it is not the case that uh, uh, all undocumented immigrants are um, unauthorized entry. A great number are people who have entered uh, with first uh, visas or other short-term visas and have overstayed. Um, and undocumented immigrants or irregular immigrants come from all over the world, not just Mexico, although Mexico represents an important, a very important share, and not just Latin America, as is often assumed, but also uh, Europe, Asia, and uh, Africa. So what is the status of, of the population of undocumented immigrants under United States law? Well, probably the most significant uh, um, and salient aspect of their lives is the fact that, uh, as, as Professor Massey mentioned, by virtue of being in the United States in violation of the law, they are potentially subject to deportation at any uh, uh, moment. Not all of them will be deported. Uh, some have family relationships or employment connections that enable them to regularize their status eventually. And, it, it, and many will never come into contact with an immigration official. But someone who is undocumented is deemed to be in this country uh, in violation of immigration laws and, it, and is at least potentially subject to um, expulsion. And the fact that they are uh, vulnerable to detention and possible deportation while they live and work here has a huge and defining effect on their experience um, in this country. It means, among other things, that they, are, they uh, are often afraid to stand up to an abusive employer or abusive landlord or money lender or spouse, for that matter, because they are afraid of being reported to the immigration authorities and uh, sent home. What it means, in other words, is that they are especially vulnerable to the abuse of power. But the story of this vulnerability is not the total story of uh, the status of undocumented immigrants in this country. There's another part of um, their legal experience that is essential for us to be aware of as well. Um, the fact is that we live in a society that maintains certain commitments to liberal democratic values that are embodied in our Constitution. Um, and under our constitutional system, <coughs> under our Bill of Rights, all persons who reside within the United States uh, are entitled to a degree of legal recognition. It says, no person 
shall be denied the equal protection of the laws. No person shall be uh, denied due process of laws. And for over 100 years now, the Supreme Court has recognized that non-citizens, even undocumented, illegal non-citizens, are included in the class of persons uh, for constitutional purposes. law that undocumented immigrants are afforded many of the same rights that uh, citizens are. They have the right to own property. They have the right to make contracts, to sue and be sued, to marry, to divorce, to buy, to sell. Um, they are entitled to full due process of law in the criminal context. And it's on the basis of this tradition as well that undocumented uh, children cannot be excluded from elementary and secondary schools. Now that's not to say that undocumented immigrants are treated as entitled to the same rights as citizens or lawful permanent residents, far from it. Um, our legal system allows for all kinds of discrimination to be visited upon undocumented immigrants, particularly in the area of welfare rights. Um, <coughs> But it's true that undocumented immigrants enjoy an important array of rights and protections under American law. And the fact that they are entitled to these protections has allowed them to construct lives that are in many respects not very different from anybody else's. I mean, they uh, work, uh, many pay taxes, perhaps not with their own social security numbers, but nonetheless uh, do pay taxes. Uh, they develop businesses, they go shopping, they get married, they fall in love, they have children, they send their children to school, uh, and so forth. And you know that when their children are born in this country, uh, when, when, when undocumented immigrants have children born in this country, those <coughs> children are automatically afforded birthright citizenship. So the status of undocumented alienage and alienage in general is not a hereditary status. So I've said that on the one hand, undocumented immigrants are treated as outlaws by virtue of their um, irregular immigration status, and they're especially exploitable because of it, but I've also said that this outlaw status is not the whole of their social and legal identity, because as persons residing within the national territory, they are entitled to certain basic um, protections of law. And keeping this, this dual identity of undocumented immigrants in mind um, is important as we try and make sense of some of the specific debates that are currently on the uh, immigration policy agenda. I think it helps us to make sense, for one thing, uh, about what's at stake in the debate over local police cooperation with um, the immigration authorities, which is an issue that we, as you know, have been focusing on um, in Princeton in the last uh, period of time. And I want to talk about that for a couple of minutes. The role of the police um, traditionally has been to maintain public safety and to fight crime in the local community. And in that context, uh, the police have tended to treat a person's status under the immigration laws as largely irrelevant. Um, they, like any other community residents, undocumented immigrants can be victims of crime, witnesses to crime, and perpetrators of crime. And the police have usually dealt with them as victor, victims and uh, perpetrators <coughs> and witnesses in the same way that they deal with everybody else. What the local police have not done in most communities is try to enforce the immigration laws themselves. And one reason they haven't is because um, immigration control has been held by the courts to be an exclusively federal prerogative. In the past, uh, the courts have held that uh, uh, states are specifically prohibited from enforcing the immigration laws. But many, in addition to this, many local communities have realized that if police cooperate with the immigration authorities, or if there's even an appearance that the police are cooperating with the immigration authorities. If the police, for example, ask to see people's immigration papers or threaten to report them to the INS, now the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, which controls uh, the regulation of immigration, this can badly undermine community relations. The undocumented uh, begin to be afraid of the police. They don't come forward to report crimes, which uh, means that they're more, more vulnerable to crimes and that indeed everybody in the community is more vulnerable. So, in response to this concern, many counties and cities around the country, and even one state, have concluded that they will adopt affirmative uh, policies, uh, what they've called confidentiality policies or non-cooperation policies, in which they declare their intention to ma maintain as confidential any information that they acquire about an immigrant's um, irregular uh, uh, immigration status, uh, to maintain that information and not uh, share it with the uh, federal uh, immigration authorities. And many police departments around the country have independently determined that they won't inquire about uh, the immigration status of crime victims and crime witnesses uh, for the same reason. 
Now what's happened in the last few years, especially since 9-11, is that the United States has become preoccupied with national security and fighting terrorism. And as part of that focus, there's been a move to get local police uh, officials involved in the anti-terrorism effort. And it's in this context that the federal government is now becoming keen on having local uh, uh, law enforcement <coughs> officials uh, become engaged in the process of enforcing immigration law for the first time. Uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, now has pilot programs with the police in several localities to train them to enforce the immigration laws. Local police departments and other law enforcement bureaus are being encouraged by the federal government to cooperate uh, with uh, them. And in addition, legislation is pending in Congress uh, uh, right now that would mandate state and local uh, police enforcement of immigration laws as a condition for receipt of certain federal funds. The trouble uh, with all this is that the rationale for local communities to stay out of immigration uh, enforcement still still stands, which is why um, the, uh, this past December the International Association of Chiefs of Police came out to publicly oppose this legislation. And this is what the president of the association said about that piece of legislation that I just mentioned that's pending in Congress that would require um, state and local participation in immigration uh, enforcement activities. He said, the IACP opposes any plan that would coerce local and state law enforcement agencies to enforce federal immigration laws without their approval. Many leaders in the law enforcement community have serious concerns about the chilling effects any measure of this nature would have on legal and illegal aliens reporting criminal activity or assisting police in criminal investigations. This lack of cooperation could diminish the ability of law enforcement agencies to police effectively their communities and protect the public they serve. A similar dynamic is playing out with the issue of driver's licenses uh, and uh, undocumented immigrants. Some members of Congress want to require that states' uh, departments of motor vehicles verify the immigration status of applicants for driver's licenses and report uh, 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 information about any uh, apparently unauthorized applicants to the federal government. Of course, I've never known a DMV official to really be in a position to determine who is and is not lawfully able to uh, remain in the United States, but um, nonetheless, that's the effort. And several states have, in fact, um, tightened their own license uh, laws on this kind of rationale, but there are other states that are going in exactly the opposite direction. Um, and making driver's licenses easier for people, including undocumented immigrants, to obtain. Um, on grounds that uh, it is better for, first of all, better for public safety when everybody on the road uh, 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 is officially registered uh, with the government, and also because they understand that the vast majority of undocumented immigrants are not national security threats um, in any event. These immigrants are here to work, to rejoin their families, to seek shelter from um, uh, violence in their own countries, and commentators point out that uh, national security is actually going to be undermined when you have a shadow population that is afraid of any sort of contact with, with public authority. So what, what, are, what are we to do? Um, many immigration restrictionists hold out the hope that if we could just control the border tightly enough, if we could just keep foreigners from coming in, if we could just deport enough immigrants who are already here, and if we could just make life unpleasant enough uh, for those who are here uh, that they would go home of their, their own accord, the problem of undocumented immigration would disappear. But actually, um, as, as Professor Massey's comments make um, amply uh, clear, the idea that we can entirely eliminate this class through restrictive measures is, is a fantasy. Under current uh, global uh, and domestic economic conditions, people are going to continue arrive, to arrive here. That doesn't mean that border enforcement doesn't have an effect on the numbers. Um, but all, very often, border control has perverse effects. People continue to cross the border, but they die uh, trying to cross in the remotest parts of the desert. People continue to live and work here, but they live further underground because of increasing restrictions and uh, increasing anxiety. So it seems to me that uh, the only sensible thing for this country to do, from a self-interested point of view, as well as uh, 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 the only fair thing for us to do from a moral point of 
you is to extend legal status to these un those undocumented immigrants who live and work here already to provide a form of legal status that can eventually lead uh, to citizenship. Um, unfortunately, the guest worker program recently proposed by President Bush uh, uh, begins to uh, uh, put the issue of uh, undocumented immigration on the agenda but it doesn't go anywhere near far enough. It would um, grant temporary status to many undocumented immigrants who are uh, already here, but the proposal as it stands does not provide a pathway to citizenship or lawful permanent residence for that matter, and that's a really um, fatal problem. There is another proposal, there are many other proposals that are being discussed uh, at the moment. There's one proposal that would provide for uh, what proponents have called earned legalization, uh, an adjustment for people who have worked here. Um, the bill, one of the bills is called SOLVE, the Safe, Orderly, Legal Visas and Enforcement Act of 2004, which is sponsored by uh, Senator Edward Kennedy. Uh, and it's worth keeping an, an eye on as an alternative to the Bush. Thank you. We're at Wayne and Charlie when we get played it. I probably would not be here tonight. Um, I'm suffering from the flu. And you can guess that that's because of all this anti immigrant activity in our community. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Professor Matt, uh, Massey and uh, Bosnia have really covered a lot, of, a lot of the territory that I want to touch on. Um, so let me just move up, uh, quickly through some of the things that I wanted that I, that I want to hit and maybe reframe some of the issues that they talked about. Um, one, I think we have to recognize that we have a problem of illegal immigration in the country. When you have um, the estimates are 8 to 12 million undocumented immigrants, it's a problem. And you know, I, 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 view it, I view the solutions as two general in two general directions. One is you can try to deport them all. Um, or two, we can try to develop a legalization program. And I think it would be great if we had some university students who could do a cost-benefit analysis of um, what would work better? Um, is the, with the investment in trying to deport the 8 to 12, you know, 12 million undocumented immigrants be more cost effective, um, or for that matter, doable at all, um, or would providing undocumented immigrants the opportunity to legalize their status, to come out of the shadows, uh, to, to become part, fully participating members of our community, um, would that be the better route? In the meantime, let's view it in the national security context. Right now, the government, um, is, it says, is in search of terrorists. And the haystack that they're looking for these few terrorists is our 8 to 12 million individuals. Wouldn't we be better off if we gave these individuals, these 8 to 12 million individuals, the opportunity to legalize their status and reduce this enormous haystack to something much smaller and much more doable? Wouldn't that make us safer? Um, As you probably can see, I, I favor uh, immigration laws that facilitate access to legal status. Um, and I believe that laws that do that will help protect Americans, will further uh, family values, and will enhance the U.S. economy. Um, of course, the opposite of that are, are the immigration laws that limit legal status, that seek to punish undocumented immigrants, um, and those laws hamper American security, they undermine family values, and they weaken the U.S. economy for the, for the reasons that Professors Massey and Bosniak have outlined very clearly. There's one law um, that I want to highlight that really demonstrates this very well. Um, following the 1993 uh, bombing of the World Trade Center, the failed bombing of the World Trade Center, uh, there were uh, a couple of very severe anti-immigration laws were passed under the Democratic President uh, Clinton. And one, of, one aspect of those laws involved a, uh, a bar um, to legal admission, the three and ten year bar as we call it. Um, and the, the intent of this law was, one, let's deter these undocumented immigrants who um, are here in this, uh, who, the immigrants who are intending to come to this country, let's deter them from coming in by telling them if you enter this country and you remain here for a certain period of time in unlawful status, you're going to be barred from re entry for three or ten years, depending on how long they are here in legal status. And if you've been here in undocumented legal status and you leave the United States and return, 
um, you'll, be bar you'll be barred from legal reentry for either the three years or the ten years. The impact of that uh, is that people who are here in undocumented status don't leave because once they leave, they trigger the bar, the legal bar to reentry. And so, as an immigration lawyer, my advice to someone who's in undocumented status who may have a, a willing employer, where the final step would require them to leave the country to finish the processing of their application on the consulate. My advice to that person is don't leave the country. You can't, under the current law, you can't <coughs> legalize your status. And it's a lost opportunity. So here's a self-defeating law. The intent was, let's punish the immigrants. And what do we have? We have 8 to 12 million undocumented immigrants in this country. If there's one thing that this government does, um, it would be very simple to do, is get rid of the 3 and 10 year bar. That way you can have someone like me advising my clients to leave the country when they have a willing sponsor and to come back through all the security filters that we want them to come back through and to re-enter in legal status. Linda Bosnia has also talked about another example that has come off as, as, self, as an example of self-defeating as a self-defeating law, and that is our driving licenses. Why is it that we uh, don't provide driving licenses to undocumented immigrants, or for anyone for that matter, who is otherwise qualified to drive in the state. We know that these individuals are here. They're working. They have children. They've got um, places to go. They have doctor's appointments. They have to um, pick their kids up. They're going to drive. Aren't we better off putting people who are tested on the road, people who have insurance on the road? Because I'd say, I don't want to be an individual who is struck by an, undo un an undocumented unlicensed, uninsured individual and have to cover those costs because of the way our insurance uh, laws work in this country. We're much better off giving these individuals the opportunity to have driving licenses. We're better protected as Americans. Um, now I'll be focusing on the area that I've been most active, uh, active in our community, and that's um, um, to what extent um, should local municipalities be involved uh, in immigration enforcement. And Linda Bosniak went to um, give some nice detail and background into what's been happening since September 11th. Um, following September 11th, the Attorney General basically, uh, John Ashbrook, um, set back, uh, set the stage um, for what we're now seeing by changing what had been the policy of uh, prior administrations, which is that local uh, and state governments do not have authority to enforce immigration laws. And the policy that Attorney General Ashcroft um, uh, promulgated is that um, local and state uh, governments have inherent authority, um, totally reversing um, the approaches of prior administrations and have an inherent authority to enforce immigration laws. And what we've seen since then is a fairly aggressive effort on the part of the administration to enlist or deputize uh, local police in helping um, and enforcing, helping them to enforce immigration laws. Uh, the issue, as many of you are familiar with now in, in our area, um, uh, first became a concern in this past spring. Uh, we saw a series of raids uh, in Trenton, early morning, in-home raids uh, in Trenton. There was a lot of concern whether the local police uh, were involved in those enforcement activities. And I think what we've seen um, since then is they probably were not involved. Um, but sure enough, um, we saw raids in West Windsor, and we saw one on Lucian Street in Princeton, uh, where our local law enforcement was tangentially involved. And the immigrant community and immigrant advocates became increasingly concerned about uh, the extent to which local police would continue to get involved. And there is a continuum of involvement that we should all be concerned about. Um, that involvement that our local uh, municipalities could be involved in could, could be as, um, as small as providing some information or backup to immigration and custom enforcement officials when they conduct a raid. Uh, they can assist in a raid. Uh, they can report immigrants for, uh, by, um, for violations um, when they pull people over um, um, for violating our traffic laws. Um, or they can, or municipalities can affirmatively seek to uh, assist uh, governments 
um, by entering into agreement with um, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency with the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the, um, 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 the immigrant advocacy groups in, um, in Mercer County in particular have been, very, have been working very hard to um, encourage local law enforcement to set clear guidelines for municipalities and particularly for the local police um, in, in terms of what, to what extent we want the municipalities involved in local law enforcement. Um, um, Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund um, and a number of other ad, um, um, advocates have um, worked to introduce an ordinance in Princeton Borough, um, which is still under consideration and is before the Public Safety Committee that seeks to do three things. One is it seeks to limit the role of local law enforcement um, in immigration enforcement activity so that immigrants will not have the fear whether they're witnesses or victims of crimes of reporting the crimes. Um, they, all, they should also not have the fear when they're walking in the street that they encounter a police officer that they're going to be picked up and reported to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, and we've seen in, um, we've seen quite uh, tra uh, uh, tragically um, in Princeton the effect uh, of immigrant fear of local law enforcement. Um, and many of you may recall um, um, in October around Halloween uh, that there were uh, attacks that had targeted immigrants. And um, one of the police officers who, uh, was commenting on the incident, pointed out that the that immigrants, um, because they're perceived as undocumented immigrants, make easy targets. Because the perpetrators believe that the individuals will not report the crimes to the police. And that's exactly what we saw with these incidents. The individuals did not report the crimes to the police, and the witnesses of the crimes did not report the crimes to the police because of their undocumented status. So, the ordinance that was introduced in Princeton Borough, one aspect of it was covering um, limiting local law, local law enforcement's involvement in immigration enforcement, so immigrants have the confidence to interact with uh, and to contact um, local law enforcement when emergencies arise. And by the way, this also applies to, to the case of fire hazards, is that there's a fire in the house. You want an, an undocumented immigrant to call the fire department. If someone's having a medical emergency, <coughs> you, want, you want the individual to call the ambulance. Uh, the fear of uh, authority applies equally to the police, the fire department, anyone wearing a uniform. A second aspect of the ordinance that was presented uh, deals with uh, solicitation of information by government officials. Uh, an, in, an individual may uh, seek a benefit from the municipality and it encourages uh, uh, the municipality to uh, limit the information that's solicited regarding immigration status to just that, just the information that's required by uh, federal or state law. And the third aspect of the uh, proposed ordinance um, talks about confidentiality and it underscores that if information is required regarding uh, immigration status, that that information will be kept strictly confidential. The point of all of this is to encourage undocumented immigrants to seek the services uh, to, to which they're eligible um, in the municipality, but specifically to have the confidence to call the police, the fire department, the, uh, med the medical uh, uh, emergency uh, people. Um, in the meantime, Prince of Burroughs passed a uh, resolution while it's considering the ordinance um, in the Public Safety Committee, and the resolution does two very positive things. One is it encourages our federal government to pass smart, rational immigration laws, the kind that Professors Massey and Bosnian <coughs> talked about. And the other thing it does is it directs the municipality to work in conjunction with the police chief to develop a policy that is consistent with the ideas that are um, talked about in the proposed ordinance. In the meantime, other activity, there's an organization called IMPACT, um, Immigrants Public Advocacy Coalition of Trenton that has been working with uh, the mayor of Trenton um, to pass very similar um, legislation in Trenton. And in fact, the mayor passed an executive order that does 
just that. It, does, it covers all the themes that were covered by the ordinance, and um, it's a uh, very positive, um, very progressive step forward that I think will move, uh, go a long way towards encouraging um, immigrants to accessing the services, particularly the local law enforcement services, uh, in the city of Trenton. <coughs> Uh, we had a fourth panelist on the program, as uh, you probably read, uh, Raul Calvimontes, who is the owner of Pelusa Travel here in Princeton. Unfortunately, I was just speaking with him on the phone. He will not be able to join us today due to a last minute emergency. Fortunately, we have a trustee of the Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund, Eduardo Arriola, who is willing to take his place uh, on the spur of the moment. So he's not prepared with a formal presentation. But let me introduce him briefly, and he's uh, willing to uh, speak a little bit about uh, the uh, how it, what's been happening in these last few months is affecting the local community. Um, Estuardo is a long-term uh, resident of, of the Princeton area. He's uh, originally from Guatemala. He came here as a teenager. Um, and um, he's a legal, <laughs> legal everywhere. <laughs> Um, and uh, he's been, he's been a, a trustee of, of the Latin American Task, uh, Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and uh, very involved in, in various activities with the community. Um, I just want to give us a, a, a sense for what's what's the feeling in the community right now. Buenas noches. <laughs> well, she told you already my name. <laughs> Only I like to say this, the uh, feelings we have in this area, since I, uh, uh, since everything happens, and uh, the only my concern is about the, all Latino community has afraid to work freely around this area, in which we want this, we asking only to be treated by human beings like we are. I came a long time ago to the United States and I just came for a better life and to give to my family the, way, the best I can. And I think Scott, I, well, for me, I've been doing good. I got my kids in school, I have the chance to give them, give them the best I can. And uh, that's, all I, that, that's all we need for all our community. To have the chance to take our kids to school, have better education, and uh, to grow up safe. Um, I hope all these um, things that's been happening change soon. That's my hope. And um, see the kids who go to school and be treated like I said, human beings, and um, to take the, all the chances they have to be educated. And for us, but as parents, we just like to work like, a, like we want. You know, we need to support our families, and just we need that, that chance, you know, to get integrated in this community. And um, it's really hard for us to uh, start a new life here because we have, like everybody knows, like every immigrant, we need to learn the language and um, the new system and takes a lot of years to do that. But just give us the chance to do that and the rest, we can do the rest. You know? And I don't have too much to say because I didn't write down nothing. <laughs> I, I, I can't prepare, right? But I hope you understand what I try to mean. And thanks to everybody for being here and to support.